Gentleman from Henrico, Mr. Morrissey. Mr. Speaker, speaking to the bill. Gentleman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I find it somewhat ironic that the gentlewoman from Campbell County, when she addressed this bill both in committee as well as today, does not discuss the health aspects of legislation that deals with the health of women. It would be a lot, it's a lot like discussing a budget, budget legislation without talking about revenue and expenses particularly given the fact that there's over 4,000 women that die each year from cervical cancer. Now, what was also absent from the gentlewoman's remarks was anything that dealt with efficacy, the risk levels as set forth by theirs, or the unbridled support of this legislation by the National Academy of Pediatrics, the National Academy of Physicians, the College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, or ACOG. What we heard was a lot of rhetoric that would move some people on some sides of the aisle. For example, the gentlewoman talked about the intrusion of the state. The gentleman from Shenandoah Valley returned, referred to the state treading in. But nothing has to do with the, sub the substantive parts of the legislation. I, I, I often find that it, it's helpful in an argument to deal with the facts. The facts are clear. Irrespective of the gentlewoman's comments about the state treading in and this intrusion of the state, let's be clear right now what we have. There is a government mandate for diphtheria, tetanus, hepatitis B, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox all communicable, no opt-out. There is a mandate for that. But never have we heard any angst from the gentlewoman from Campbell County about that mandate. Also, we didn't hear anything about a health legislation, a vaccination that dealt with the vaccine adverse event reporting system, or VAERS. The facts were set forth at committee that there have been over 266 423 doses of this vaccination. And when James Farrell, the Director of Immunizations from the Virginia Department of Health, testified before a committee, he said that the adverse response is approximately 77 a year, and it mostly involves minor, all, no, excuse me, it all involves minor irritations like redness or uh, slight swelling. But that wasn't discussed. Now, what's interesting is that when we talk about this mandate of the state, let's, talk, let's please be clear what the mandate is. Let's be clear what this body, is, this government, is now doing when it's intruding. You didn't hear it from the patron. You'll hear it now. The mandate is the following letter. Tell me how onerous this really is. The legislation mandates that Catherine, Karen Remley, the state health commissioner, send this letter out. And this is what she says in her required letter. Quote, the 2007 Virginia General Assembly passed a law that requires the Virginia Department of Health to provide the parents of rising sixth grade girls with information on human papillomavirus. What a, what a mandate that is, to provide somebody with information. It goes on to say, after reviewing the information provided in the reverse side of this letter, that would be the side you're looking at, please contact your health care provider to determine if your child should receive the vaccination. That's the onerous mandate that is going out. So we can talk all we want about the intrusion of the state and the Virginia being the only state where this is required. Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, it's utter nonsense. Let's talk about what we're, let's, let's deal again with the facts. The facts. The Commission on Human Medicine, CHM, said there are no serious risk. National Health Magazine said it is a myth that the vaccine puts lives at risk. Center for Disease Control, CDZ. CDC said studies have shown the vaccine to being overwhelming, overwhelmingly safe. 
with 35 million doses being given out. The American Academy of Pediatrics says no evidence that the vaccine causes serious health issue. Pediatricians give this vaccine to sixth grade girls. What percentage of pediatricians support this? 98 percent. The American Journal of Public Health said that the two high-risk strains, number 17 and 18, have been in implicated by this cervical cancer. What I particularly liked, and what I'm sure that my friend and the delegate from Prince William County saw, because he reads everything, because he is the Catholic Medical Association, CMA. The CMA supports the widespread use of Gardasil for girls and women in the age range. And they went on to say, the fact that HPV is sped primarily by sexual contact does not render vaccination against it unethical. Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll, I'll yield when I'm finished. Gentlemen, um, would the gentleman yield for a question? Gentlemen, yield. I'll yield when I'm finished, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman refuses to yield. Now, again, not one person who has spoken in opposition to this referred to an article in any magazine like the New England Journal of Medicine, Pediatrics, ACOG. My colleague from Campbell County, when she did refer to it in, co in committee, referred to an editorial that anybody could put in there. Let's be clear what this is all about. There is a suggestion that these young girls will be vaccinated and somehow that will promote promiscuity. What nonsense. We're giving sixth grade girls and 98% of the pediatricians support it and endorse it for the following reason. These girls grow into young women. These young women get cervical cancer to the tune of 11,000 cases a year. How do they get cervical cancer? Through sexual intercourse, through men who carry the virus. The woman can be chased. She can never have had sexual intercourse, but can get cervical cancer because somebody gives it to her. This vaccination prevents it. Why would we not want young women who grow into young ladies to avoid getting cervical cancer? Because it's government intrusion? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll now yield to my friend from Prince William County. Gentleman Neal. Gentleman Neal. Uh, yeah, I, I, want, I want him to yield. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, the gentleman uh, indicated that he wanted us to be attentive to facts. And he suggested that for the, I think he said 11, it doesn't matter which, uh, communicable diseases for which we require vaccine, that there is no opt out. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would ask whether or not it is a fact or not that on lines 57 through 63, that in fact our law does provide for religious, philosophical opt out or the personal physician of the uh, child to allow an opt out. So is it not a fact that we do allow an opt out, Mr. Speaker, contrary to what the gentleman just stated? Mr. Speaker, point of parliamentary inquiry, is the question to the speaker or is it to me? I thought I was yielding to a question, and if it is to me, I'll address his question. I would rather subject it was to you. I would tell the gentleman it is an opt out, and indeed, if you'd read the letter that the code requires the state health commissioner to send, it says, quote, whether or not you decide to have your daughter vaccinated, the decision is between the family and the doctor. Exactly what the gentlewoman from Campbell County said doesn't occur. You must it suggests you go see your doctor and you, the doctor and the patient and the parent decide. So it is exactly that. Would the gentleman yield for another question, Mr. Speaker? I would. Will the gentleman yield? Gentleman yields. Thank you. If you receive a book in the mail and you were told, unless you opt out of this, you have purchased this. And if this book came from the government, would you not be subject to a kind of a coercive pressure to accept what's going on to make you take the step of, well, I really don't want this, and now I look like the odd man out because I'm not following a course that was, has been determined to satisfy the requirements of the common good, 
uh, as uh, applied by the legislature of Virginia. Doesn't it put the burden on you rather than the other way around and the coercive power of the state comes against you as an individual under these circumstances? Mr. Speaker, I would tell the gentleman it does not. You might, you're not listening. Here's what you refer to this book and this order. Here's what it says, and I'd ask you to listen carefully, and you tell me if it's an owner's burden. Dr. Remley says, please contact your health care provider to determine if your child should receive the vaccine. Doesn't sound too onerous to me, and the law requires that Dr. Remley send this letter. That's the burden. That's the level of state intrusion that you're speaking of, and it's simply not accurate, and it's simply misleading. Would the gentleman yield for a question? I'll yield, Mr. Yield. Speaker. Thank you. Gentleman yield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman I, at least appears to represent that full information is being given by the Commonwealth of Virginia upon which parents are to make a determination as to the safety of their child. Would the gentleman tell us whether or not the information conveyed also tells the parents about a Supreme Court decision of February 22, 2011, I think it's Berkowitz versus Wife, which in fact the Supreme Court has stated that, you know what, if a safer vaccine could have been made, it's just tough luck for you because you can't sue. We won't let you, this go to a jury. We won't let this go to a judge because we place an absolute shield around these drug companies. Does that constitute full and fair information to the parents to make an informed decision? Is that information conveyed by the health department regarding the best interest of their children? Yes or no? Mr. Speaker, I would tell the gentleman, is your question rhetorical? I will repeat the question, Mr. Speaker, if the general will yield. Mr. Speaker, given yeah. that it's not rhetorical, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it succinctly. No, the letter that's sent by Dr. Remley does not reference any Supreme Court cases. It's a three-paragraph letter that, in essence, boils down to this. Hey, parent, there may be a virus out there. Hey, parent, you might want to talk to your pediatrician. And hey, parent, after you talk to your pediatrician, you might decide to do the vaccination. It is as weak and as mild and as mellow as my mannerisms. No more questions.